Boa tarde a todos, mais uma vez. Vamos lá com o nosso terceiro e último webinário dessa série sobre internacionalização que tivemos nas últimas três segundas-feiras. É o resultado da parceria entre o Lipa, que é o Lipa de Internacionalização do Instituto C da nossa FRTE, e a Universidade de Western Michigan, nos Estados Unidos, na WMU. Uma das outras vezes, teremos certificado disponível da nossa frente o formulário de presença na descrição aqui da nossa live, que fica logo abaixo do vídeo. É o mesmo procedimento de cinta que vocês fizeram. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos. Hoje nós teremos mais três apresentações disponíveis para vocês e tratarão do tema O futuro da pesquisa e da colaboração entre instituições. É um professor... Doutor Alexander Dana, a professora doutora Virginia David e a professora doutora Penina Arigu. Lembramos que hoje o momento de perguntas e respostas vai ser após a última apresentação. Então, a gente queria encorajar você a ir enviando as suas perguntas simultaneamente às apresentações no nosso chat e a nossa equipe vai estar a postos para anotar e auxiliar nesse processo ao final das apresentações. A gente dá início, então, ao nosso, ao nosso primeiro momento e convida agora para o webinário o doutor Paulo Zagallo Mello, que é o Associate Provost for the Henrique Institute for Global Education. Doutor Paulo, mais uma vez, muito obrigado pela sua presença e o espaço é seu. Olá, João. Olá, Boa João. tarde. Olá a todos na Rura Linda. É um prazer de novo estar com vocês nesse terceiro webinar da parceria da Rural com a Western Michigan University. Uh, nesse, nesse primeiro webinário, a gente falou do, de como continuar o sonho de estudar nos Estados Unidos e o, o, o nosso enfoque foi mais uh, os, uh, mobilidade de estudantes. No segundo webinário, nesse da semana passada, a gente falou sobre colaborações uh, virtuais nesse tempo de pandemia. Um, através de Global Classrooms e Virtual Study Abroad. E neste terceiro webinário, como o João referiu, a gente vai falar sobre uh, colaborações de pesquisa, um, como desenvolver colaborações de pesquisa, e para isso a gente, uh, uh, a Western tem hoje três uh, convidados que vão falar sobre uh, a sua pesquisa aqui na Western, com a particularidade de Dois desses convidados, dois dos nossos professores de hoje, um, do webinário de hoje, uh, de serem brasileiros. Uh, e a terceira uh, professora que nós convidamos a um, ter um, bastante experiência uh, no Brasil um, e de ter levado durante vários, vários uh, anos uh, os seus estudantes para, para uh, visitas. Uh, e conferências no Brasil. Portanto, todos os nossos palestrantes de hoje um, conhecem bem o Brasil e, e, e têm uh, bastantes uh, uh, colaborações com, com o Brasil. Então, foi, uh, foi por isso que nós também os convidamos hoje para, e, para um, e nos apresentarem a sua, a sua pesquisa. Mas, em especial, e muito além de, 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 das colaborações que esses três professores têm com, com o Brasil, um, eles foram convidados porque são, um, são extraordinários pesquisadores e professores nas, nas suas áreas. Um, e na, penso que as apresentações serão em inglês, provavelmente com algumas intervenções pelo meio em português, mas na, na sessão de perguntas e respostas no final, um, penso que pelo menos dois dos professores poderão responder em, em português a algumas das perguntas, se necessário. Um, então, eu passaria a apresentar o nosso primeiro palestrante de hoje, mas antes, antes, de, antes de eu passar a, a essa... Um, primeira apresentação, eu gostava de convidar todos a visitarem no YouTube o nosso uh, YouTube channel para pesquisa. Portanto, no YouTube, se pesquisarem Western Michigan University Research, 
uh, vocês terão acesso a um, a, um Western, a um channel, YouTube channel, com muitas intervenções de pesquisadores de muitas áreas e exemplos de pesquisa da Western Michigan University. Então, eu convidava todos, uh, mais tarde, a... Um, a visitarem o YouTube channel Western Michigan University Research. Ora, o nosso primeiro, um, o nosso primeiro palestrante de hoje é o professor Alessandro Santos, mais conhecido aqui no campus por Alex. O professor Alessandro Santos é professor de uh, fisioterapia, e é um fisioterapeuta licenciado, aqui, tanto aqui nos Estados Unidos como no Brasil. O professor Santos tem um, um, fez a graduação em, em uh, fisioterapia na Universidade Estadual de Londrina e fez o mestrado, uh, na, fez a residência na Universidade de São Paulo, na USP, Fez, tem mestrado pela Universidade Estadual de São Paulo e o doutorado pela Penn State University aqui nos Estados Unidos. Uh, tem também o, um postdoctoral fellowship, fez um postdoctoral fellowship também aqui nos Estados Unidos, na Arizona State University. Depois foi um, professor na Universidade de Montana, que foi, aliás, onde nós nos conhecemos, devo dizer que o o professor Alessandra Santos e eu conhecemos quando ambos trabalhávamos na, na Universidade de Montana, que foi também quando conhecemos a Amanda Farias, a representante da Western Michigan University no Brasil, <risos> por curiosidade, que estava com o Ciência Sem Fronteiras na Universidade de Montana. Um, o professor uh, Santos trabalha muito com colaborações, um, colaborações um, internacionais e já teve muitos, uh, muitos uh, bolseiros do Brasil e estudantes internacionais do Brasil, Turquia uh, e inclusive até de Portugal, que é um país que vocês já devem ter adivinhado pela minha pronúncia de português, deste português esquisito, não é? Um, eu não vou falar da investigação do professor uh, Alessandro Santos, porque é por isso que ele está aqui, é disso que ele vai falar. Então, sem mais uh, demora, eu passava o, o nosso virtual mic para o professor Alessandro Dana dos Santos. Alex, floor is yours. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. So, thank you very much for the chance to come in here and, you know, show a little bit of our work. So the idea today is to provide everybody who's watching with a flavor for the many lines of research that we have in our lab, okay? So if it comes to the point at the end that I have uh, some time to go a little bit more in deep about one of the studies that we are uh, finishing up right now, I, I will do that as um, uh, with pleasure. However, uh, remember that you guys can um, find me on the WMU website, okay? And I'm open to any questions at any time that um, you guys need anything clarified. So feel free and do not hesitate to contact me at any time that you feel compelled to. And so I'm going to start the presentation with uh, a presentation of um, oops, let me just start sharing the screen first. There we go. So, so I'm going to start uh, this presentation um, showing a little bit of the work that we do in our lab. So our lab is um, a brand new lab. So it's called the Laboratory for Advances in Rehabilitation Sciences, or LARS. And so I am the current director, uh, and this laboratory is one of the laboratories that it has been created for the development of the um, physical therapy department. So as of now, we have several collaborators from Brazil. These are active collaborators, um, meaning that we have papers and studies that they are on different uh, uh, degrees 
of completion and different levels of development. So um, more specifically, so this is me um, as a director. A good friend of mine is the co-director of the, of the laboratory, so Dr. Daryl Lawson. Um, his interests in research uh, are more related to orthopedics uh, uh, problems and pathologies that they can come from orthopedic uh, trauma and also wound therapy. Uh, Dr. Degani is also a Brazilian PT um, uh, who works with me for quite some time. I think that we have now more than 18 years uh, of uh, scientific work being developed together. So she's also a uh, uh, professor who is in our lab. From Brazil as of now, so I just selected here, so my major four partners in Brazil, there are several other countries that they collaborate with our laboratory, but both Dr. Alessandro Magalhães and uh, Dr. Vinicius Cardoso from the Federal um, uh, University of, Parna of POE in Parnaíba, Dr. Luis Moshizuki from the University of São Paulo, and Dr. Patricia Giuso from the Federal University of São Carlos. So uh, what do we do? So basically the laboratory has a different approach to uh, the new problems that we have in science. Even though science has been set down in a very particular uh, set of guidelines, uh, our laboratory is not only focused on the development of science per se, but we are also looking to provide um, a space for those professors, for those students, or any um, member of our community, local and international community, that they would come with their ideas and start developing uh, their skills as scientists. We also provide educational uh, education in science. So um, I always have uh, the lab opened for students that they're interested in uh, honing their skills uh, in the areas that we work on. So our efforts are concentrated on this main five lines. So we are looking in principles of motor learning and relearning. So motor learning uh, on the beginning uh, of the uh, uh, human lifespan. So how we learn and how we utilize principles of neurosciences in learning movements. And after that, relearning in those cases where an injury uh, to the central nervous system occurs. So for example, a stroke or CVAs or Parkinson's disease, how we can uh, uh, explore some of the principles in order to uh, optimize those skills that the person still has. I have a um, uh, large interest in how the brain controls multiple muscles. So multi-muscle multi control and multi-joint control is uh, one of my major areas of attention. Um, I am, most of my basic research is related to the neural mechanisms or how the brain develops different mechanisms in controlling of these uh, movements. And we utilize these principles to develop a new uh, methods of assessments for interventional uh, um, uh, tools. And so we utilize this knowledge in order to create uh, ways to evaluate if an intervention or a treatment is being uh, if, um, efficient in terms of its um, outcomes. And also we utilize the same principles in order to develop uh, interventional technologies. And that includes assistive devices, wearables, prosthetics, orthotics, any type of material that it's dedicated to uh, favor a uh, rehabilitation, uh, both um, uh, physical and cognitive rehabilitation for these patients. So we can uh, divide the research, the, the, we can um, divide the research that we do into two major branches. One that it's basic research. Under basic research, our mission is to promote scientific development of the principles regarding human movement, controlling health and disease. So that means that we are looking for the neural mechanisms that they are uh, in place 
to promote movement control in both health and disease. And we use this basic research to promote our translational research. Uh, for our translational research, our two missions are the development of reliable clinical procedures that they're going to be aiming the evaluation uh, of performance of human fine control of movements and the development of mobile technology to increase our reach. So once I mean, um, once I say increasing our reach, I mean uh, we have several areas, uh, not only in the United States, but abroad, where uh, they depend for healthcare, they depend on small clinics that they are usually not equipped very well as uh, large centers. And so we try to develop mobile technology at low cost uh, in order to reach these areas and promote a better quality, quality of life for uh, those citizens living in those areas. So going a little bit deeper in uh, the basic research on the area of basic research. So our main interests are in principles of that the central nervous systems um, uses to control um, uh, multiple segments of the body. I am very interested in development of analytical methods and modeling. So I do um, uh, most of this research related to um, distribution of what we call neural inputs that they come from the central nervous system to the musculature. So I investigate uh, how they're um, uh, created and how they're delivered uh, to this musculature. Um, also, I study uh, those situations where we are uh, preparing and how we modulate responses to external and internal perturbations. So how people, they can prepare and respond to um, uh, um, perturbations that they can induce a fall. So that is one of the areas of research that we are dedicated, dedicating for developing better methods to evaluate and treat high risks of falling on those that they are uh, of uh, older age. Uh, we work with inter and intrahemispherical interactions during planning and execution of movements, more specifically how the left side and the right side of the body, they interact with each other. Uh, most of the work that we do uh, on this area is related to uh, stroke rehabilitation. So we explore principles of neuroplasticity in order to uh, test our hypothesis. We also um, use principles that they guide uh, facilitation and inhibition of patterns of movement. So what are the situations that they favor uh, some of the patterns and some of the situations that they inhibit certain, certain patterns of movement, both in health and, and uh, disease. So we can utilize that in rehabilitation. In terms of our targeted population, um, we are interested on every single aspect of uh, neuromuscular, um, um, uh, and the neuromuscular areas, both in health and disease. So we study patients uh, across different stages of the lifespan. So we have research that they're dedicated to children, to adults and elderly, both health and disease, uh, high level athletes, aging, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, and it goes on. And so we are not um, only targeting one type of population because our basic research is intended to uh, understand a little bit more about um, these principles of uh, neuromuscular control on all these situations so we can understand that a little bit better and make that into uh, interventional procedures. Uh, based on that, our translational research, as I mentioned before, we are interested in development of diagnostic methods um, and interventional methods. So as of now, we are working directly with um, reduce, uh, reducing high risks of fall, improvements of coordination and improvements of cognition. Uh, more specifically, these are areas that um, 
They are being dedicated to the elderly and myotraumatic brain injury. And we are also starting to work with methods of cortical stimulation. So in this case, we are still working with external um, uh, methods of cortical stimulation, but it's in our plans to start internal stimulation of the brain and brain stem um, as we move forward um, uh, along the next years. And we are also looking, uh, looking at, we are working on a better delivery of telemedicine. I will explain that in a little bit. The same thing, our targeted population doesn't change from our basic research, mostly because our translational research is um, uh, rooted to those same principles that we develop uh, on basic research. So these are some of the examples of work that we are doing as of now. So this is a um, system that we are developing for delivery of uh, telehealth. So right here, we are uh, creating a system where uh, you can see here, this is my son some time ago. Uh, I think that this is uh, two years ago. Uh, this is one of the first prototypes. He cannot see what is going on on the screen, but basically what he sees in here, what we see in here, uh, he sees inside this um, um, goggles. And he can interact on the same way that he would be interacting with a computer, uh, he's going to be interacting with the goggles. So it is a system that the person can interact with, and it's based on um, um, uh, the necessities that we have in not only uh, deliver uh, tele telehealth, but also to uh, promote um, um, distance education. So this is a type of system that we are envisioning to use on our lectures, um, um, more specifically anatomy lectures that I am responsible for. So this is one of the types of work that we do. This is another system that we developed for, it's called the Balance Lab. This is a system for evaluation and intervention of higher risks of falls. So not only the hardware that you guys are seeing in there, they have been uh, mostly developed by us, but all the modeling and algorithms uh, regarding to uh, body sway studies or a body sway examination uh, was developed by us. So this is a force plate, a simple force plate that captures the amount of body sway that the person has. And based on this body sway, we have now the ability to tell um, who's under high risks of falling or not. And so there are several studies that we have that we are developing to um, uh, provide the normative values uh, regarding to this type of technology. Um, we work on creating our own databases. So, for example, once we create a database for the Balance Lab. We, uh, once we created the Balance Lab system, we created its own database. So we study on providing normative values and interfaces for data collection in other areas. So for example, um, people that it's working with me at the Federal University of POE, uh, we have developed a database where they are collecting some of this data. And so this example here, it's a database that we developed for the use in certain areas of uh, the state of Montana. So this, uh, the state of Montana had a very large problem related to myotraumatic brain injury. So concussion was a big problem for them. And so we started developing a way to probe and start creating ways for um, uh, investigating what are the areas and the types of problems um, that myotraumatic brain injury was bringing to each one of the areas in the state of Montana. So we developed this, and this is some one of the type of the work that we can do. Also, we developed um, several um, uh, specific hardware and software for analysis of human performances that goes all the way from electromyography to um, uh, fine coordination of the hands. So this is a specific work that we are dealing now 
in order to improve um, um, the ability to use um, or to redevelop, to relearn fine movements after a stroke um, uh, happened to our patients. Um, we also um, are always inclined to look to the problems of our communities. So this is something that just happened two days ago. So there was a pro problem in our community where kids, they were not having access to face masks or face shields. So we decided to produce uh, some of them and donate to, the, to our areas. And so we created our own um, uh, model. Um, we assembled that and we created what we call the unbreakable face mask, a face shield. And so this is a type of work that it's not only um, um, restricted to you know, basic sciences, these are some of the products that we are developing now uh, for small clinics on our area. So this, for example, is a low cost spirometer that we are producing to be um, uh, donated to small areas or rural areas in the state of Michigan. This is a device that we are um, developing for uh, evaluating reaction time. So both visual and uh, auditory reaction time. These are very simple tests that we can uh, use for screening patients that they may need further investigation. And so they can be sent to larger centers for further investigation. This is a uh, array that we are developing for uh, treatment of wounds, so wound therapy. And this is a handheld dynamometer that um, we are providing to uh, the rural clinics in town to help on a project that involves um, children with cerebral palsy. And uh, just to um, finish, this is our entire um, our entire model of work is based on this principle. So we utilize what we call the sensor motor integration principle, okay? So in order for us to move, and when I say move, I mean action, okay? So an actions doesn't always involving uh, a segment going from one place to another. So that is a way that usually people think. However, once I'm talking about actions, I'm talking about coordination patterns. Coordination patterns um, of muscle activation that they can generate balance control. Um, it can involve eye tracking. It can involve grasping control. And so for the development of all these tasks, one thing that it has to go extremely well and fast is the integration of all sensory information that it's coming from the eyes, that it's coming from the vestibular centers, uh, inner ears, and also from the proprioceptive system. So those organs that they are embedded on the skin, on uh, the tendons and muscles. And so all this information that it's coming from the periphery needs to be integrated by several areas on the central nervous system in order to provide the musculature with the ability to be activated at the right time and with the right amount of tension. And so this is the way that we see um, happening. Um, so all the movement uh, or all the actions that we, that we as humans, we perform, they are dependent on this optimal sensor and motor integration. Uh, in cases of trauma or disease, there is a suboptimal integration of this sensory, um, um, uh, the sensory motor integration. And so in those cases, um, suboptimal coordination patterns, they're going to show up. And so more specifically, we're going to see delays in information transmissions. We are going to be seeing delayed uh, reactions, and we are going to be seeing uh, altered uh, synergistic patterns of muscle activation and muscle production. And we utilize these indices to tell if something is going wrong. And so that can go from very subtle changes that they happen from concussive uh, 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 syndromes all the way from those situations where portions 
of the central nervous system is compromised by a CVA, for example. And what we are looking for is to define uh, what are those situations that they can be uh, leading to other traumatic episodes. So those that they have that they have had a concussion, for example, uh, if this suboptimal coordination patterns, they're very subtle there is a good chance that those healthcare providers, they're not gonna be able to pick that uh, uh, abnormality in time before a next traumatic episode uh, occur. And so we develop all this, uh, uh, this is an example why we develop all this um, um, uh, uh, missions in order to investigate what are the suboptimal patterns, what is wrong in terms of um, central nervous system control. We translate that into providing um, our scientific community with normative values. And from that point on, we develop the uh, uh, hardware or the gadgets that they're gonna be picking up on those um, uh, abnormalities. So this is in a nutshell, what we do um, here, you guys have um, my email address. So please do not hesitate to contact me at any time that you feel, you know, like um, you would like to work with us or just to clarify a question or two. So I'm not sure if this is what you were looking for, but um, I hope that this helps to understand what we do in our lab. Obrigado, Alex. Não. É mesmo que a gente estava esperando de, da apresentação. É um overview uh, com algum detalhe, claro, uh, da pesquisa que você desenvolve aqui na Western Michigan University. Eu devo acrescentar que o, o professor uh, Alexander Tanatos Santos é um distinguished uh, Uh, researcher de, 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 em, em, em fisioterapia, um, reconhecido um, aqui nos Estados Unidos e também no Brasil. Um, e temos um, muito gosto em tê-lo na nossa equipa do Western Michigan University. Thank you. Uh, eu vou passar a apresentar a nossa próxima palestrante, uh, que também é originalmente do Brasil. Um, e um, um, a professora Virginia David, que é um, professora do nosso departamento de Special Education and Literacy Studies, uh, no nosso College of um, Education and, and uh, Human Sciences, and Human Development, perdão. Uh, e a professora David... Uh, fez a sua graduação no Brasil, na Universidade Federal do Espírito Santo. Uh, o seu mestrado, uh, uh, a graduação em literatura, língua e literatura inglesa, uh, fez o mestrado na, já nos Estados Unidos, na Universidade de Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, em mestrado em, em Teaching English as a Second Language, e fez o seu doutorado na Michigan State University em Second Language Studies. Tem uma experiência uh, muito grande em, em, uh, nas áreas de ensino de inglês como segunda língua. Uh, tem trabalhado nessa área há mais de 14 anos. E... e é a pessoa responsável, a professora responsável aqui na, na Western Michigan University pelo nosso, uh, nosso programa de TESOL, de Teaching of English as Second Language. Uh, para falar mais em detalhe sobre a sua pesquisa e o seu trabalho aqui na Western Michigan University, eu passava a palavra à professora Virginia David. It's Muito great obrigada, to see you, by Paulo. the way. Há muito tempo que a gente não se vê pessoalmente, portanto, Faz é uma boa oportunidade mesmo. também, não é? Para nos é. vermos aqui na, virtualmente através da Rural. Exatamente. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigada. The pela... floor is yours. Muito obrigada pelo convite. Um, é um prazer enorme estar aqui. Um, 
Eu vou, deixa eu começar a share my screen também. Ok, aqui estamos. Ok. Então, um, eu, eu vou mudar para o inglês daqui a pouco, uh, mas eu sou a coordenadora do programa de mestrado de um, TESOL, que é Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages, um, no Colégio de Educação, uh, Education and Human Development, aqui na Western Michigan University. Um, e nós também temos um doutorado em, em TESOL, se alguém estiver interessado no mestrado ou no doutorado. Um, okay, so I'm switching to English now. Um, so um, I have many research interests, um, including conversation analysis, which is what I decided to talk about today. Um, but I'm also interested in task-based language teaching, which is a, a fairly new and new, maybe in the last two decades, um, teaching methodology for teaching foreign languages. I'm also interested in second language writing, um, um, second language writing assessment as well, and also for um, interested in professional development for um, ESL teachers. So um, the reason why I decided to talk about this particular study is because um, I worked with a lot of um, students in at the university I did my master's degree, uh, Brazilian students. So I thought it would be interesting for you to see um, what I came up with, with the help of my Brazilian participants. Um, so the plan for today is that I'm going to introduce you to conversation analysis and um, what it is, sort of, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, also uh, of particular interest to my study is uh, word searches, communication strategies. Um, I have to make sure that you understand what those are in order for you to understand um, the context of my study and my data. And then we're gonna talk about the study. So um, conversation analysis um, was sort of created in the 60s and 70s as a subdiscipline of sociology. Um, it has since kind of separated and become its own uh, field. Um, it was initially used to describe ordinary conversation between acquaintances and friends. And so uh, what researchers, CA researchers are interested in is natural conversations. Um, and it seeks to describe how talk is organized. So how is talk sequenced? How do people take turns talking? Um, how do people do repair? And repair is when you make a mistake. Um, it doesn't have to be a grammar mistake, but you, you pause and you have to go back to what you were saying before. Um, so that's sort of a quick explanation of repair. How speech acts are organized. So speech acts are things like um, how to apologize in a certain language, how to invite people in a certain language, um, how people tell jokes, how people tell stories. Um, and initially, it looked only at these kinds of uh, things in natural conversations. But um, more recently, researchers started looking at institutional talk. So institutional talk is talk that happens, say, in the classroom or on the news or at the doctor's office. And so people, researchers have started looking at that. And so one kind of institutional talk is also classroom talk. So there's plenty of research on uh, related to English as a second language classrooms that um, use conversation analysis as a tool to look at conversations and analyze what is happening in more detail. So I'm not going to read all of these boring explanations. Um, I'm going to just try to explain from what I what I know of conversation analysis. So CA researchers analyze the structure of conversations and how the participants orient to what has been said to make meaning, to construct meaning, to understand one another. Right. And so it tries to, as Numa Marquis says in the second quote, It tries to explain in emic terms, emic means from the inside as an insider perspective, the conversational practices that speakers orient to. So the only context that matters to conversation analysts is the context of the conversation. Um, and they try to look into the conversation to find answers. They don't try to make guesses and, and for example, say, oh, maybe he was saying that because he has this experience with that. Um, it really matters. What, what, what matters is what is in the conversation and what we can see, what evidence we can see. And so conversation analysis seeks to answer the question, why this in this way right now? So what, why 
are people doing this or saying this in this particular way at this particular moment? And they look to previous sequences in the talk and to sequences later in the talk to try to explain that question, try to answer that question. Okay. So the context of this particular study, um, I came to the United States to do my master's in TESOL. Um, and that was a long time ago, uh, 2008. And I, it was time for me to write my master's thesis. And so I was very interested in conversation analysis and I had a lot of international um, student friends. And so I decided that I wanted to collect data and look at natural conversations, but I didn't really know what I was going to look at. And then halfway through the data collection process, which I, I will explain how I did that later, I decided, oh, I really want to look at how people use communication strategies when they are talking to one another. And so this is exactly the purpose of this particular study is to investigate how second language learners of English use communication strategies when searching for words. I'm going to define that in a moment in naturally occurring talk outside of the classroom. So not in an ESL class, but these are all people learning English as a second language. So how do they use communication strategies? In particular, what I'm going to talk about today is how one particular person participant used his native language, which was Portuguese, um, as a communication strategy. So what is a word search? Um, we, we, this happens all the time. And after I define later on in the day, you're going to start searching for words and think, oh my God, I'm searching for words. And then you're going to remember all the things that I said, hopefully. Um, so what is a word search? It's when a speaker is trying, is trying to find a word that they momentarily forgot or not, not immediately able to locate. So what does it mean when you are searching for a word? For native speakers of English or any other language, it usually means that you just forgot that particular word, right? But for language learners, it could also be, it could be that you forgot, but it could also be that you don't have that particular vocabulary item for the word that you want to say, or you have it in your native language, but you don't have it in English, right? So what are some things that we do when we search for words? There's been a lot of research looking at many, many hours of data, um, and they found, particularly Goodwin and Goodwin found that when you are searching for a word, you typically pause, you elongate vowels, and you're gonna see very specific examples of that in my data. Um, you use fillers like mm, or in Portuguese it would be eh, um, you display a thinking face. Now there's an emoji for that, um, but you display a face that you looks like you're thinking about something. Um, you typically, if you're talking to somebody and you are in the process of searching for a word, you typically shift eye gaze from the person you're talking to to somewhere else. You usually look at no one. You don't um, you don't continue to look in the eyes of the person you're talking to. You can snap your fingers pound the table. These are all examples of things that people do when they are searching for words. So how are word searches resolved? They can be self-resolved, which means that the person, if you initiated the word search, then you remember it and you use the, the word that you forgot. Or you may ask people who you're talking to to help you locate that word or find that word, right? And so usually when you are inviting people to participate in a word search, you return the eye gaze to the person or people you are talking to. You may also ask for help. Um, so you might say, how do you say this? Or what's that word that means this? Um, and then oftentimes too, especially for, not especially, particularly for language learners, um, Language learners may orient to a person in the conversation that might be more a uh, more expert in that target language than themselves. Um, so, in my case, it was it was in the the data that I'm going to show you. It was typically me because I was at the time still am um, an English as a second language teacher, and my friends knew that, and so they would usually look at me and ask me, um, "How do you say this in English?" Um, so usually after there's an invitation to participate and after there's a question for help, um, the person who's being asked the question 
can offer a candidate solution. And so candidate solutions are typically asked, are typically given with upward intonation. So whenever I say upward intonation, I mean as a question, right? So um, the person who initiated the word search can accept or reject that candidate solution. Again, you're gonna see all of these things that I'm talking about, you're gonna see them in the transcripts that I'm gonna show you later. Um, so another piece of my study, as I mentioned earlier, was to look at communication strategies, right? So what are communication strategies? Um, it's when you find yourself in a moment where you cannot communicate something, and so you try to find other ways to communicate. So it could be one example here is circumlocution. Circumlocution is when you try to explain what you mean using other words. So that thing that we use to make phone calls, right? A telephone, for example. Um, language learners are known to make up words in the target language. So that's word coinage, when you just invent a word based on what you know about the target language. Um, approximation is when you use a synonym. So a word that means it's the same or a similar thing to, to the word you're looking for. You may use a literal translation. So you may translate something literally that perhaps doesn't apply to the second language. And you may also use your native language, which is exactly what we're looking at. Um, other things include gestures, sounds, um, pictures, right, visuals, and things like that. So these are all examples of communication strategies. So who, these were all uh, of my participants in the study, but I'm not gonna bore you with the details of all of them. I'm going to talk particularly about these two participants who are in my study and me, I was also part of the conversation that was recorded. But um, Jason was at the time was a visiting scholar from Brazil um, at this large Midwestern university where I did my um, master's degree. And he had been in the United States for two months only. So he had only been there for two months. His English proficiency was quite low. I would say he was probably a high beginner or low intermediate level of English. And his field of study was economics. And then Jake was also another participant in the study and his native language was English. And he was a graduate student from Canada at the time. And then me, I was doing my master's in TESOL and I had been in the United States for 18 months. So the way I recruited my participants was I asked my friends if they would be willing to come and be video recorded while talking. And I promised them that I would feed them pizza or whatever they wanted to eat. And that's it. I told them I was looking at natural conversation. I didn't tell them exactly that I was looking at communication strategies. I just told them that I was, I just wanted to see how people talk outside of the classroom, how language learners talk outside of the classroom. Um, and I also did not tell them to do anything. I didn't give them a worksheet and, and say, you have to talk about this, or I didn't give them questions to talk about while they were talking. They really, I turned on the camera and we started hanging out like we would. All of the participants were friends. They all knew each other. They were all grouped in groups um, in such a way that there was no, there were no three people that spoke the same native language. Because for example, if I had three Brazilians, then they could choose to speak Portuguese the whole time, right? Um, so I wanted people to use English sort of as a lingua franca, as a, a language that they all had in common. Um, and so for the group that we're looking at again is group one, there were two Brazilians, myself included, and one person from Canada. Um, and then I video recorded the interactions for 60 to 120 minutes. Again, I didn't ask them to do any activities. Um, Jason and Jake, both, both of them, of course, these are not their real names. These are pseudonyms. Um, they knew that I was an English as a second language teacher. So they knew that I had that expertise. That was um, sort of common knowledge. So um, conversation analysis, Transcription conventions are quite heavy. You might look at the conversations and feel a bit lost because there's so many symbols, but um, just in a nutshell, if you see brackets, square brackets, that means that people are talking at the same time. And then if you see numbers, that means that people um, paused. Um, and the reason why it's important to record these very minute details of the languages of the talk is because these things can signal 
important things like word searches, like I mentioned before. A micro pause, um, abrupt cutoff of word or, or sound, you'll see a hyphen. Anything in double parentheses are comments or details of the scene because you won't be able to watch the videos. You're only going to be able to read the transcript. If you see a colon, that means that um, that sound is extended, elongated, because again, like I said before, that's a sign that people are searching for a word. Uh, an equal sign means that there's no interval between people talking. So they're almost, almost overlapping, but not quite. And then italics are words or phrases spoken in a language other than English. And in our case, it'll, it'll always be uh, Portuguese. So this is the first transcript. These all come from the same conversation. Um, and Jason was talking to Jake about the Pan American Games, which were held in Rio in 2007. So this, the data was collected shortly after the Pan American Games, um, I think two years after. Um, and so if you look at, so we're just gonna go line by line with this conversation uh, and I'm gonna explain what is happening. So Jason starts by talking about the Pan American and then there's a one second pause. That's a very long pause for conversation. Uh, people usually don't pause for that long. And there's another pause is near the, and then he says favela, favela. And he looks at me while he's saying favela. So the pauses indicate that he could be starting a word search. And then the fact that he repeats the word favela twice and then looks at me, the eye gaze shifting to me in that conversation means that he's asking for my help. And I give him the word. I give him the candidate solution, the slums. So two things to notice. One is that in line one, favela is not said with upward intonation. There's no question mark. He's not really asking a question. He's almost demanding an answer. Oop, there's an airplane going by, sorry. Um, and then again, my candidate solution is also not given with a question intonation. It's given with a, a falling intonation, the slums. So I am sure that this is the word that you're looking for because I know what favela is in, in English. And then he repeats the word, but he repeats it incorrectly. He says lums. Um, and Jake is paying attention and answering, okay? And so he says, near the lums, and then again, there's a pause, there's a filler, the é eh in Portuguese, é, eh. another pause, he repeats the word, the, finish the games, another very long pause, the people of the lums, 1.6 second pause, robe, and then he says, robe, and then he looks at me as soon as he says, robe, and then I say, yeah, they robbed, so I kind of corrected his uh, pronunciation there. He continues to look at me and he repeats, um, they robbed the, and then again, he does not, when, sorry, the, the thing got messed up here. This was supposed to be aligned with this. Um, Jason says they robbed, and then he points to the bathroom and says vaso sanitario um, in Portuguese and looks at me um, and then continues to look at me. And I give him, he stares at me until I give him the candidate solution, which is toilet seat. And then Jake reacts to the story. Oh my God toilet seats. So what's really per interesting about the data that I have here with Jason is that he he almost he has a very interesting dynamic that any he's always talking to Jake throughout the 2 hour video of them of us talking the three of us talking he has his eye gaze towards Jake. And whenever he wants a word in English he turns to me and he asks for that word in English. And so I am acting as his sort of like live dictionary Google Translate button that he just looks at me and I give him the translation. So that's particularly interesting in my data. So again, he's looking at me, looking at me as an expert speaker of English. And he comes to me whenever he has questions about how to say something using his native language, obviously, which is Portuguese. So this next excerpt, um, he is, he again, Olympic Vili, and then he has a, a very short pause, is building another pause, and then he has very long pauses, one second, two seconds. He's e elongating in, in, and then he uses the filler again, eh, and then he says porto, porto, but he's not looking at me yet. He's, he's displaying a thinking face, um, which is very typical of people searching for words. And then he pauses and then he finally looks at me. That, that shift of eye gaze to me 
signals to me that he's asking for help. And he asks, Região Portuária. And he still looks at me until I give him the, the candidate solution, harbor. Again, the candidate solution is with falling intonation, not rising intonation, um, which is typically not the case for candidate solutions in word searches. So in my data, that shows up a little bit differently. And then he says harbor and looks at Jake and continues to talk to Jake. And then this particular um, excerpt is also interesting because I give him the wrong candidate solution and no one notices and I didn't notice until I was looking at the data. But he's talking about The Economist, the magazine. He's still talking about um, how the Pan American Games will bring a lot of economic benefit to Brazil. And so he says, The Economist. He pauses, Economist. And then he says, eh, pauses again, eh, and then looks at me while he's um, saying Economist and pausing. And then he says, one materia, com que é? Looking at me. And I say, course. As you know, the word article in Portuguese could mean um, materia, like, uh, not the word articles, the word materia, sorry, can mean curso, right? Or it can also mean artigo, artigo de uma revista. But I misunderstood him. I said, course. I probably didn't know what The Economist was at the time. I was newly arrived. Um, to the United States. And then he continues saying one course this week, and then that elongation, the pause again, another pause, all of these things signal that again, he's searching, beginning to search for another word. Um, and then he says article. Um, he mispronounced the word article. Um, again, probably because of Portuguese, the word artigo, the stress is in the second syllable. So he transferred that um, to English and says article. And then he displays the thinking face, but he does not look at me. But I go ahead and say article. And he says article. Eh, and then he starts another um, word search again. He pauses for a second. He elongates the filler eh. He says eh again. And then he says Brazil. And he does this with his hands. Um, he moves his hand up in the air like an airplane taking off. And he looks at me. And then I say we'll take off. And he says, eh, take off in the world. And he looks at Jake and another plane is landing here, sorry. Mm, Brazil, take off in the world. Um, so again, you see examples of him using his native language, of me giving the candidate solution with falling intonation, not rising intonation as if it were a question. Um, and again, of Jason using me as his personal Google Translate button that he just looks at me and gets his answer and continues to talk to um, Jake. So conclusions of this data set, and I'll probably just really briefly mention things that I noticed in the other um, hours of um, data that I collected for the same study. So there's a lot of use of the native language as a communication strategy, particularly for Jason but also for people who didn't really share the same native language as me. So one example is there was one Italian woman who asked me, how do you say ombretto in English? And I didn't know what ombretto was because the word in Portuguese is sombra de olho, so eyeshadow. She was asking how to say eyeshadow in Portuguese. So there was another Italian who asked how to say asudo in, <clears throat> in English. So even when people didn't share the same native language, they still use their native language as a communication strategy. Um, the native language occurs together with other strategies like gestures <clears throat> when um, when uh, Jason said decola, right? Gestures, um, appeals for assistance, like turning the eye gaze back to other people in the conversation, or in that case, uh, me, rising intonation or explicit questions. Like uh, at one point, Jason asked, Right. Um, there were many other communication strategies used also. A lot of people invented words um, and, and so on. So another thing that was of particular interest in my study, interesting in my study, was that learners often asked for assistance from a more expert speaker of that language. In that case, it was me, because they all knew I was a teacher. Um, and other researchers have found the same um, 
the same piece in their data, but they only found that happening with upward intonation. Whereas in my data, I found examples of both um, language learners using upward intonation or falling intonation to ask for help, but shifting perhaps the eye gaze as a clue that they are asking, inviting somebody or me, inviting me to participate in their word search. Um, most researchers also found that the candidate solutions happened with upward intonation, but in my data, there's both upward and falling intonation. Um, and in my data, word searches happened pretty much 100% of the time because the learners did not know how to say something in English. And what was interesting too was that the more, the lower the learner's proficiency level, the more they used the native language as a communication strategy. Whereas for more proficient speakers of English, they tended to use other communication strategies like explaining what they meant using other words. So one final thought, because I'm, I'm still, even though I train teachers to be English as a second language teachers, I still teach um, ESL um, to immigrants as sort of a volunteer thing here in Kalamazoo. And so one final thought is, what do you think about the use of the native language in English as a foreign language classes or any foreign language classes? There's a lot of controversy regarding this question and a lot of teachers and perhaps some researchers say there should absolutely be no use of the native language in the foreign language classroom. But I see, I see some value if, if the native language is used in, in the way that we saw in my data, right? So we saw that if learners don't know how to say something in English, they can ask and they can be given the answer and then they can later, and this I definitely saw in my data, they later use that word in the conversation later on. So there could, these, these native language uses could potentially become opportunities for learning new vocabulary, right? So if you are interested in learning more about conversation analysis, because there is plenty to learn, you are welcome to email me or ask me questions towards the end. If you are interested in our master's in TESOL or our PhD in education and human development with a focus on TESOL, please also uh, feel free to email. Do not hesitate to contact me. And thank you very much. Muito obrigado, professor Virginia David. This is really interesting research, especially for a um, non-native speaker of English mm -hmm. who was once, you know, a, a, actually I never had um, formal ESL training in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that now, and frustrating that I find myself using all those techniques to look for vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while I speak in English because it's not my native language, as well as when I speak Portuguese because I've spent so much time thinking, uh, writing, working, dreaming in mm -hmm. in in English yeah. uh, that I have to look for my own language's vocabulary when I move back to speaking in Portuguese. So yeah. I use all those, I recognize myself in using all those feelers even when I'm speaking my native language because I don't practice it enough anymore i guess yeah um which is you know somewhat sad <laughs> <laughs> and english is not even my second language foreign la or second language actually french was my first foreign language and english was only my second for a foreign language so uh, i sometimes feel that you know and i used to have uh, pardon the modesty i used to have very good vocabulary in portuguese which I feel that, you know, is kind of escaping me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, it de it's but definitely it's... escaping me too. Because I, I, mostly, <laughs> I mostly use Portuguese with my three and my five-year-old. And so <laughs> if I were to give this presentation in Portuguese, it would be a three to five-year-old version <laughs> of this presentation. But it is, it is very, very interesting uh, research to me. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much. You. We're going to move so to our... Um, third and last um, panelist for the day. Um, and that is um, Professor Ina Arigur. 
and Professor Arigur um, is, um, she did her graduate uh, studies in Israel, in Haifa, at uh, Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, and she and her, her masters and, and doctorate are in the areas of materials engineering and physics, which is the areas that um, um, she works on. She's a, a distinguished uh, researcher uh, in material science, and she works in research in our material science laboratory as well as our virtual reality 3D laboratory here at, um, at Western Michigan. Um, and she she also did a postdoc um, in materials engineering at the University of British Columbia in Canada. She has uh, worked uh, extensively with with Brazil, and I know that she even took many students, many of her students, to Brazil. And her actually her students have won prizes in Brazil for their. Uh, for their um, research uh, and their presentations. So it's it's a pleasure to have you here uh, today, uh, Dr. Arigur. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, here today. And um, I'd like to invite you to talk a little bit about what you do here at Western, especially the research uh, labs you work with and all your incredibly amazing research in materials engineering and material science. Thank you. The mic is yours. Obrigada. And I should really say now follow Portuguese. So it will be entirely in English. Uh, and oh, let's see. I have to share the screen first before I... Okay. Uh, share screen. And... Um, hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, share screen. Okay. I have. Okay. Um, I hope my screen is shared. You can see my uh, slides. Uh, no, that doesn't seem the case. Okay. Um, no, we we can't see the. We yeah, can't see the yeah. I, so I did, if you yeah, if you see me. the share screen button below yeah, on your I, yeah, I did the uh, press on that. Okay, share screen. I'll do that again. Uh, yeah, and it does show me um, application window. Okay, and okay, I think that will do it now. Okay, uh, does it show my PowerPoint now? Yes, it's coming through. Okay, you're good. Thanks. Oh, good. okay. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, it's an application I haven't used before. Okay, yeah. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited uh, to talk to you. And uh, I'll give kind of an overview, so I won't go into depth in any area, but I should uh, say, first of all, that uh, I am a strong believer in international collaboration, so for sure I have uh, very good uh, colleagues in uh, Brazil, also in uh, several other countries across the globe, as well as in the United States, in the uh, Department of Energy Laboratories, and of course, my wonderful students that uh, you can't do it without them. So a little bit uh, an overview of my research. And by the way, you have here my web page as well as uh, my email. And um, so I, I kind of divide in a way my research areas to two main fields. One of them is the more science-based and the other one are the more engineering, which are application of the science. So in terms of the science, I work in smart materials, always with an eye to applications for medical, aerospace, and so on. Of course, automotive being in Michigan. And uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more. And uh, as part of that, I talk uh, about alternative energy, which everybody knows why it's important these days. 
Um, I, uh, I, I do have an NSF grant in uh, civil engineering area. That's where I use uh, smart materials for seismic damping uh, to avoid disasters or disastrous results when there is a natural disaster. And uh, I uh, use uh, smart materials for the virtual, what we call virtual white cane. I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, I also have a project on a smart football helmet. Um, Alex talked about concussions. We all know that uh, concussions are a big issue in uh, football. Not the Brazilian football, but the American style football. So I uh, develop with my students smart helmet that absorbs the shock and uh, reduces the damage to the brain. And uh, again, as I say, <laughs> an international collaboration. So you see here my students say uh, that were with me at UFSCar uh, for research and they won first place in international competition. You see my students that came with me to my collaborators in Moscow. I have more pictures in the next slide. And uh, my biggest uh, funding source is the National Science Foundation, but I also have grants from NASA, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and some industries, of course, as well. I'm a strong believer of the international, so I, as a service, I am the faculty advisor of uh, Engineers Without Border at the WMU section. We founded it uh, several years ago, and uh, the students are ready to go once they lift uh, all the restrictions on travel because of the pandemic, they are getting ready to go and build uh, better water systems uh, in Guatemala. And uh, okay, yeah, some of my res recent honors, so that doesn't matter. Um, so in terms of laboratories, laboratory facilities, uh, we have excellent laboratory facilities. I had uh, an NSF uh, award uh, for top of the line X-ray diffractometer. Uh, it's a very unique one, uh, the only one in the state of Michigan, closest one similar is at NASA in Cleveland, NASA Glen in Cleveland, so uh, it was uh, almost uh, half a million dollar, I got it as an NSF grant, another uh, NSF grant was the uh, physical properties measurement system, uh, that's uh, over $600,000, so these two tools together alone uh, really provide um, excellent facilities to do the research. My scanning electron microscope is not top of the line, so I hope that will be the next uh, funding for major research instrumentation from NSA. And then I have all kinds of other processing equipment, and I do work at the laboratories off campus as well, uh, Department of Energy and similar. So a little bit about my students. So you already saw uh, the students that were with me at UFSCar, they're in the top right. Next to them, I put uh, the Kemsey students. These are high school students, and they won a prize, not only uh, the regional, the top prize in the regional, but also a prestigious award in uh, Intel International, which is the largest pre-college competition. Uh, to the left of them, there is uh, Eric presenting uh, his work on the virtual lab and uh, he was an undergraduate student at the time. I did send him to Brazil uh, to um, demonstrate and train the people there in uh, the uh, virtual lab. And you can see him at the bottom left in Brazil when he was at uh, UFMA in Maranhão. Uh, then uh, Eric and Tyler getting first prize in uh, Turkey and the, the virtual, uh, one of the modules they developed is to the left of them, that's the virtual tensile machine. Uh, okay, a little bit out of Brazil, so uh, when I was on sabbatical in New Zealand, my Russian collaborators came to visit me, so we had some discussions, and we presented together a seminar. So you see my uh, New Zealand colleagues, as well as my Russian colleagues with me after the seminar. Again, a picture at UFSCar, uh, then I, I, I during the years that I went to Brazil for my research, I tried to take not only students, but I took uh, different years, different colleagues of mine to get them exposed a little bit to um, international research. So this was one of my colleagues that I took with me. Uh, the um, two of the students here are Brazilians, the rest are Americans, and you can barely tell who is who. 
uh, then my uh, national uh, department of energy colleague, uh, Dr. Yang Ren, and myself in the national lab. Oh yeah, and at the bottom right is uh, my other student, Tyler, that uh, went to instruct in a, and, and give a workshop in the virtual lab, and this one was at uh, IFMA, also in Maranio. Okay, that's a little bit about... That's a little bit about uh, the engineering campus, which is uh, very different uh, than the rest of the campus. Uh, that's a campus that was built especially for us, uh, us meaning engineering and computer science, to uh, be integrated with industries around and uh, have a lot of uh, exposure to local industry and affect them with our research and vice versa. Uh, you see here uh, our sun seeker, so that's the solar powered car. And it's a beautiful campus. Yeah, also we even have Einstein on campus, so we are very happy about that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about smart materials. Uh, a lot of what I do is in the area of smart materials, again, in the more basic science as well as in uh, the practical applications. What are smart materials? What makes them smart is essentially that they don't just, are not just there, they don't just support load or you know, but they actually do something. And of course, you all know, um, a, like a, the lithmus a paper that changes color with the pH. Uh, you know, you have the temperature control, you have a thermostat. So these are materials that respond in one way or another to external stimulation. And we both develop, develop them as well as uh, use them for applications. Uh, what you see at the center are the famous uh, stent for the arter crushed arteries. Uh, it's a uh, very small, very narrow outside the body, and you put it in the arteries, the warmth kind of expand them, and they support crushed arteries. And you see them in uh, artificial limbs, etc. Yeah, and of course, uh, braces. Many people have experienced the pain of braces. It's much less painful when you use smart materials that they uh, really fit themselves to your mouth. So ferroic materials are smart materials, a specific group, and uh, we talk about they change their properties uh, as a result to some kind of a temperature change or field. And uh, we really talk about, well, this is a very generic one, so I, and we do work on miscellaneous of uh, those uh, ferroic materials, but they work at different length scales, so they can go to the nanoscale, micro, and macro, and uh, we use them for uh, whatever is uh, the best for the application. So for example, piezoelectric materials, which are relatively uh, established materials, they uh, will produce uh, electric uh, voltage when you change their shape, as you see in this animation, and vice versa, you change the voltage on them, they will change the shape. So they can be used for many applications, uh, we specifically in my lab use them mostly for uh, producing energy or what we call energy harvesting. Um, and the harvesting can be for uh, many unexpected uh, uh, sources. For example, we all walk. Well, we walk, we create mechanical vibrations and then we can use those mechanical vibrations to create energy. So one of the examples, and we used it for uh, several projects, one of the applications uh, was uh, for creating, um, uh, this is uh, a vest that has uh, sensors and uh, is connected to a Bluetooth, uh, for a Bluetooth to a, a cell phone to give alerts to people who are uh, visually impaired um, about all kinds of obstacles that are being detected. Uh, what you see on the right, at the bottom right, uh, is a, what we call trip detector, and it is powered by piezoelectric materials. And the two, student, two high school students that won the prize uh, actually worked on this specific project. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about shape memory materials. Some people may have heard about the regular shape memory materials, if you did. Um, you know, I hope you like them. So what happens uh, with these materials you, um, they have a memory, and when you hit them, they will go back to the shape they had originally. So why is that so good? Uh, you saw actually the crushed arteries that you saw before are kind of shape memory materials. So what we are looking at here on the right 
Uh, you can see dental implants. So um, people that had dental implants talk about the big trauma when you pull to the um, implant in the mouth. Uh, so when you use a uh, shape memory, you actually freeze them. You freeze uh, the smart material to a very low temperature. You embed it in the mouth and then in the warmth, it really fits into place with uh, no trauma. Actually, I have seen uh, people who walked from the dentist office happy with really no trauma the same day. Well, I understand that the regular uh, implants can be quite painful, quite a bit of trauma. As you see, the application in space. This one is actually um, at my colleagues in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, you see the long um, column. You cannot take it into space in this size. It's uh, well over two meters. And it was taken into space, totally folded heated in space, and then it sprung into all this length. So there are really many applications to shape memory materials. So the concept, I go over it light because, uh, you know, I don't want to get into too much into the science of it, but essentially what we have in materials are many times what we call phase transformations, and that's the secret here. Uh, now, when we talk about nitanol, nitanol is the classical one. I work on a more advanced one, which is nickel, titanium, copper. But the whole concept here is that you can change the shape very dramatically and not break it, um, you know, and not change it permanently. Uh, take, for example, take a paper clip and straighten it. It will stay this, play, this way. Take a, you know, a paper clip made out of smart material. You shaped it. It stayed this way. You put it in warm water and it goes back. It remembers what it used to be. So um, th this has a lot of application that I'm going to talk about. But first I'll show you. So you start in a low temperature phase and you strain it to 15%. That's considered huge, huge deformation for something that will not be permanent. And you just heat it and it goes back to the high temperature phase. It remembers what it used to be. We wish we had such good memory, right? So um, yeah, but so the... Okay, okay, here we go. So this is one of the applications that uh, we did uh, with this uh, shape memory. As I say, ours is slightly different. It's not nitanol, it's a more advanced one. So we built out of it uh, nano tweezers, what are called nano tweezers. And that, that is made by a composite, part of it is the shape memory, and then it's coated with what we call elastic. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, we hit it with the laser inside the microscope and the heat of the laser causes it to bend so it can grab, it kind of becomes a tweezer, it can grab. Then we remove the heat of the laser, it sprung, springs back to its original shape. So, uh, so we can use it as tweezers. Uh, we actually, I didn't bring it today for the sake of time, but it can actually pluck a mosquito hair inside the, the uh, focused ion B microscope, but you can really use it for very fine, uh, as very fine tweezers, which is very important in uh, medical research. So I wanted to show you briefly, and this, this uh, video was actually done by uh, my colleagues in Russia. So that's why there is also the beautiful music. So um, the secret that uh, I will tell you is underneath the paper, there is uh, a hot plate. So that's the secret why they change their shape when uh, they are dropped on top of it. And now he's going to lift them. And, oh no, there you go. Yeah, they are uh, going to lift them and uh, then uh, they straighten up because now they are cool and they, they like each other, so now they're going to dance together. So yeah, this is the artistic part, but it's very practical, as I mentioned. 
Now, uh, Knight and All also have another property which is highly desired, and we call it super elasticity. So this does not involve temperature at all. Same material, but entirely different phenomenon. No way uh, high temperatures are involved here. Uh, what we are, we are already in the high temperature, relatively high temperature of what we call austenite. We change the shape and um, then uh, we return. And when it is in the austenite, it will return to the original shape because there are what we call phase transformations that happen because of the deformation. It goes back to um, the original shape. So this is super elastic. So now you wonder why that is important, right? I hope I convinced you about the shape memory. Why is super elasticity important? Well, so this is one of the applications, my friend, at, my friends at NASA. So um, uh, this is the NASA Glenn Research Center. And, uh, you know, when the Mars rover was developed, uh, it needed tires. Now, uh, there are several reasons why uh, the tires that we use uh, for everyday vehicle will not work. Uh, the surface of the moon is, uh, or Mars, sorry about that, surface of uh, Mars is definitely uh, harsh. And on top of everything else, temperatures are very low, which we all know that rubber will not survive. So they tried to make it out of a hardened steel, but it was quite beaten up and it did not work as well. So instead, um, they came up with the idea of using the super elastic nitanol. And if it works, I, and the, that actually works because it goes back to shape. So, and there was not, oh well. That was not in the plan. Uh, yeah, that's not my video, so YouTube always gives us some commercials. Here we go. So these are the tires. And the... NASA has spent half a century literally trying to reinvent the wheel. On Earth, wheels with pneumatic tires have proven very effective and efficient, but the Moon and Mars are not very friendly to the average car tire. NASA has designed all sorts of wheels and tires using various materials, but even their latest creation, the Mars Curiosity rover with state-of-the-art wheels designed specifically for Mars, started taking damage after moving around on Mars. Engineers began to notice significant wheel damage due to the unexpectedly harsh terrain. So NASA had to go back to the drawing board and come up with new wheel designs. NASA Glenn Research Center has just reinvented the wheel, a new tire that can go back to its original shape after having undergone deformation. This invention was possible thanks to a shape memory alloy. Yeah, it's actually the super elastic, but that's a Santo Padilla Tadila, he's, he's like a big expert in the field. So, uh, okay, uh, what, what we do in my lab? So I told you about the concussions in football, and that's a very well-known statistics that most of them really get uh, that much beating that they really suffer from traumatic, traumatic brain injury. So um, what, what can you do? There is the helmet, but uh, the more impact is absorbed by the helmet, the less is absorbed by the head. So uh, we, de we developed, but we continue to develop a football helmet that will absorb um, much more energy. And uh, we are in the process of making it a a even better and better, but we already managed to get at least at room temperature a 40% decrease in the impact. Uh, we do try to make it more generic for a broad temperature range because football is American football is played at extremely high temperatures and extremely low temperatures. So we, uh, we work right now on uh, expanding the uh, temperature span of um, those helmets or the super elastic material inside. And okay, so move a little bit to magnetic shape memory. And they were invented by uh, Kari Ulako, my colleague from Finland. Uh, he's the one who is not me in the picture. Um, and uh, so in 1996, he discovered that uh, you can do the same concept of shape memory that we saw before for in with the temperature. You can actually do it with um, 
a magnetic field. Well, these are different alloys, of course, but you can do it with magnetic field. It's much faster than a temperature. It has many advantages. Uh, some parts you don't want to heat them. So uh, these are magnetic shape memory. What you see, of course, the, mag the magnet is simulated, but the material inside, and you see all that huge movement, this is a real material, so it's fantastic. One Tesla is a, like a refrigerator magnet, so it's not huge. Okay, so uh, yeah, there are certain conditions to get uh, uh, those properties. Again, I will not spend too much time on it, but uh, as you see, you, you need a merge of uh, preconditions. Martensite is the phase. Uh, magnetic and isotropy won't get into that. So essentially, when we have all these three conditions, together, then we get uh, the magnetic shape memory uh, effect, and then magnetic shape memory alloy. And this, this is, by the way, it's good for many applications, obviously for actuation, uh, you know, all kinds of movement that you want, uh, but also you can use it for what we call later on, we'll talk about elastocaloric effect for producing alternative energy. So it's a very important phenomenon and we've been working in my lab on those for a number of years. Okay, so something else that we do with the same uh, material, uh, materials, the same group of materials uh, that are magnetic shape memory, we work on green refrigeration. So what's the whole deal with green refrigeration? What's not green about the current one? Well, first of all, the amount of energy that is being used for a uh, uh, refrigeration is amazing. It's, <laughs> people are not aware of it. So 20% of US consumption is really a lot. And it's going up, it's continuously going up. Even during pandemic, people stay at home. Um, so it's even more so. Uh, so there are many disadvantages. First of all, is the low efficiency. There are the uh, <laughs> infamous uh, CFCs, and uh, which cause the depletion of the ozone layer. So the bottom line, definitely not green. So we work on green refrigeration. Uh, some, some of you may have heard about thermoelectric materials. If not, that's okay. I like thermoelectric materials. I work on them too. They are nice, but their efficiency right now is only 10% or less. So yes, yes, they're very nice scientifically, but practically they don't really do the job. So caloric materials, which are ferroic materials, which really tie in with the magnetic shape memory that we talked about, they are green and they produce alternative energy. So the, uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll explain the process here. And that's uh, what you see here. And intentionally I put this one because that kind of sums uh, several kinds of caloric materials uh, for uh, the same purpose, but there are different effects. And as I say, some of them have several together. So my materials, are both uh, magnetocaloric and elastocaloric, in fact, also somewhat of barocaloric. Electrocaloric are different. So anyway, so three phenomena are in my materials, and we start at a certain temperature, we apply a field, and field is a misleading word because, word because we think about magnetic, we think electric, but actually field can be strain, okay, or stress, you apply stress on the material. As a result of it, the temperature will go up, then uh, we release that heat, just like in every refrigerator. And then, uh, so we go back to the temperature of the ambient. Now we remove the field. The field was there all the time. We remove the field. So now the temperature will go down and now it can absorb heat. So it refrigerates and the cycle continues. So again, it can be magnetic field, electric field, stress field, and so on. So far I've concentrated more on what we call the giant magnetocaloric effect, so it's with magnetic field. Again, my materials are also good for elastocaloric, and uh, that's uh, definitely the plan to continue. Um, I don't know how much uh, I want to spend on uh, explaining what happens there, uh, but, um, well, but essentially what we have the concept with the giant magnetocaloric effect is a combination of both structural, so we have crystalline structure transformation that you can see briefly in, at the bottom, as well as what we call magnetic spins. And as you see, they can be organized in one way, they can be organized in another way, it can be totally messy all over the place, um, and that's uh, another way. And each one of these uh, states will have uh, uh, different heat properties, 
And what we want in order to get the maximum of uh, that magnetocaloric effect, in order to get the maximum, uh, what we need is to merge what we call specific anti-ferromagnetic. Martin, that is the structure, anti-ferromagnetic is the magnetic properties, to ferromagnetic austenite. So merge the two type of transformation so the effect becomes much larger, as we call it giant. And trust me, it is giant. So it's very large. So that's one thing that we work on and it's, it's working. It's actually going pretty well. So what do we want to do next? So we want to work on multicaloric. So you do both the magnetocaloric, elastocaloric with the same material. Obviously you increase the phenomenon. So that is uh, definitely a better effect and that's uh, one of the goals. And the other one, I assume everybody heard about the nano, nano, everything is nano, very, very small. And uh, that will be useful in uh, very small devices, electronics. So that is uh, the other area. And we look at uh, different uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, the, uh, uh, what uh, you see here, uh, the uh, melt spinning, for example, is uh, those samples are made for me by uh, NASA. I don't have uh, this machine. I have a colleague at NASA who makes those for me. Uh, so this is what we do in this case. I also try to work with a colleague at Western on using uh, artificial intelligence in order to come up with a better design. So that saves a lot of money when you do it all with artificial intelligence without needing to do that much trial and error. So that's another venue of uh, what I'm working on. And as I'm kind of nearing the end, I should really say, so I love working with the students from everywhere. I love hosting them in my lab. I love sending my students elsewhere. And I also, and that is something that is very important, uh, my students do what we call senior project or capstone project in their last year of study. And I would like them to do, uh, and I've done it before with students, international collaboration, which means your students can actually work with my students and communicate over like the way we communicate today. Uh, so one mode or another of electronic communication, in addition to email, but hold regular meetings. And each part of the group in Brazil and in the US will do a separate part of the same project to bring it to fruition. Uh, from my experience, uh, both uh, sides of, uh, of the, you know, both, both sides of the border, I should say, uh, a, a benefit from that Brazilian students love working with the American students, gain experience. And in fact, from experience of having Brazilian students in my lab, um, they, they told me, you changed my life. Um, I know that uh, people told me that it was uh, an important factor, like one of them uh, told me when he was accepted at Imperial College in London, uh, that experience was very important in the decision uh, of accepting him. And other uh, stu Brazilian students that spent time in my, in my lab told me that uh, his employer in the industry was very interested in what he did in my lab. So it's, it's an invaluable experience, although now I'm talking also about uh, um, that uh, remote communication, but that experience of uh, international uh, communication, international project is invaluable because that's how companies work today. All companies are international and there are meetings that uh, take place over uh, some mode, Zoom or WebEx or any mode of uh, remote communication. And especially, I think in this day and age, everybody uh, during the pan pandemic understands it better than any other time, uh, the big advantage of uh, having such a project. So I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to start doing this kind of collaboration anytime, you know, really even this semester. So please do get in touch. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Professor Igor. It's really incredible research and uh, it connects with so many fields. You know, it's not only um, well, well outside engineering. I mean, material science has that uh, very interesting um, ability of, of connecting with almost everything we do nowadays. 
Um, I think we might have some questions. Um, if we still have our panelists here, uh, and I think Juan will give you back yeah. the mic. I know you're you're following our YouTube chat. So, do we have uh, any questions for our panelists? We have a couple of questions here. Um, let's start from the beginning, right, Dr. Dr. Alexander? Um, First question we have for you here is from Sergio Silva. He asked, what's the difference between clinical and translational research? That's a good question, by the way, uh, because they overlap in, in, several, in several instances. But translational research is uh, identified as the first steps on translating the principles that they have been found on basic research into previous or early development of clinical trials. So clinical research is a step that is taken once this uh, translation has happened already. And so it's a step that it's on a more future stage from going from the bench to uh, to the patient. And so there are several stages that they overlap, but usually we divide them into basic, translational, and from translational clinical. And so that is a very rough uh, explanation of that, but that's, that's what we, that we take into, into account on, you know, uh, explaining both of them. Yeah, great. Uh, we have another question for you, Dr. Alexander. Um, it's from the Dr. Luis Maya. He asks, um, the brain is both hardware and software, right? So as they interact, supposedly in treatments, has your group considered or looked at One Health approaches to promote health? One Health meaning uh, inter interacting, integrating animal health, human health, and environmental health. Absolutely. That's, 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 the, that's the main... Um, objective of doing that. The problem is um, to test the hypothesis in order to in order to achieve that goal, we have several principles that they have to be uh, looked into it first. So for example, one of the um, one of the examples that I bring often is the need for a unified language. We do not have a unified language across several, um, um, fields that they allow us to, you know, uh, move forward or too fast in, on that way. So, for example, there are some uh, terms in physics that they are very good for physics. They have been developed for physics, but they were not developed for biological systems. And sometimes mm -hmm. we utilize those terms that they have been developed for physics into biological systems, and so they do not fit very well. And so, and so there are several there are several stages for us to get to that accomplishment. But I agree with him. But we're still taking steps towards that on uh, progression from, you know, all the way from developing the correct language, the operational systems. After that, putting everything together to make one thing. Amazing, great. Um, uh, next question is for Professor Dr. Virginia. Dr. Virginia, Henrique, could you please? Okay, Dr. Virginia, hello. Hi. Great presentation also. And um, we have a question here from Moisés Filho. He asked you, do you also research on computational linguistics? By the way, congratulations on your research. It's a pretty interesting topic. Thank you for your presentation. No, unfortunately not. That's a very out of my comfort zone uh, field, mm -hmm. computational linguistics, but really interesting. Yeah. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, what's the importance of paralinguistics in word search? And it's possible to imply that there are some paralinguistic features in texting communication, such as WhatsApp. What do you feel about it? Okay, so I'm assuming paralinguistics is non-linguistic cues, non is that correct? Yeah. Okay, right. um, it's extremely important. That's why we do video recording when we when we uh, do conversation analysis studies nowadays. 
100% of conversation analysts use uh, video because there's a lot of things that happen with gestures and eye gaze and um, other things like that. So extremely interesting. Um, I am assuming that somebody out there is starting to look at to to do apply conversation analysis to WhatsApp or texting because mm -hmm. that that is definitely an under researched area. And definitely, especially now with the pandemic, we're doing more online learning. So I also saw another question um, in the YouTube uh, questions about using um, applying conversation analysis to look at um, online learning and teaching of language. And I think that's amazing. So I think there's a, a need for looking at for using conversation analysis for WhatsApp texting and then also online learning and teaching. Yes, but. Uh, Non-linguistic elements are uh, highly important for for word searches, like the snapping of the finger, the thumping of the table, and eye gaze, and thinking face, and all of those things. Yeah. Great. Um, another question for you: Do you believe machine translation will play an important role for these communication strategies on the near future? And um, what's the importance of technology in general on this matter? So, of are word? we talking about using? Uh, translation machines for transcribing conversation analysis data? Yeah, perhaps transcribing or, um, I don't know, uh, small devices maybe, mm -hmm. so Google or... Mm -hmm. If it is for transcribing, I think th there's a very limited use because there's a lot that machines don't pick up yeah. when it comes to communication. Um, but they do use, there, there are machines that, that are used to to transcribe data. But usually the researcher goes back and checks, double checks um, with the actual audio, if that was the question. If not, email me and we can talk more about that. <laughs> do, do you have any, any analysis of word search, uh, maybe um, researching with professional professional interpreters at work? With professional what? I'm sorry. Interpreters or translations, translators at work? No, maybe. I have not, no. I, I have personally haven't done that research. I usually look at just learners talking oh. to one another. Yeah. Great. Um, another another question for you. Um, Professor Lee said this was a very interesting topic. I wonder how conversational analysis can be used to investigate investigate limitations of Zoom, Google Meet, and other platforms for language teaching and learning. I love that question. I think this would be an amazing research project that should definitely be done. Um, yes, I'm, there, I'm sure there's a lot of limitations and I'm sure that we, perhaps we can look at progress for language learning online versus face-to-face. -face. We can look at differences in, in how the conversation goes with online learning and face-to-face -face. that yes, and, and many other possibilities. That's definitely an amazing very interesting um, look at conversation analysis for the future, yeah. Great. One last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Julia asked you, um, uh, is conversation analysis a helpful area for teachers to track their language students' progress? I think I think there is there is room to use conversation analysis to look at language development. Yes, it would it would be very labor intensive though because so in order for you to translate about a minute of conversation, it could take you two hours because you're looking at people taking breaths and you're looking at pauses and you're counting the pauses. And so it's very labor intensive. There would be a lot of data to transcribe and it would have to be a longitudinal study. You would have to be looking at, say, week one versus last week of, of the year or the semester. Uh, but yes, you could definitely do that. You could look at how learners are doing turn taking are they getting better at turn taking uh do they have fewer pauses right so are potentially are they more fluent than they were in the beginning are they using more complex vocabulary so yes definitely um okay thank you very much for your presentation i think we have a, a couple of questions for our professor nina Are you good? hello I'm professor good. nice talking to you great presentation by the way um First question, uh, you, you kind of already answered, I think, on your presentation, but could you talk a little bit more about the connections your research have with companies and the, the job market in the US? 
Uh, yeah, and that's a good question. Um, I, I have done a number of uh, industry-funded research, and that includes uh, Hewlett Packard and Google. I do try to concentrate in recent years more on uh, national funding, like the National Science Foundation and NASA and so on, uh, simply because um, the, uh, the amount of money that is available there is much higher. Uh, companies do usually fund at a lower level, but they do work with companies, but to a lesser extent in recent years. Great. Um, you had a lot of experience with international students also, right? Correct. Which do you think, uh, which do you think are the main, the main struggles while studying abroad? And how can uh, an institution prepare better to receive students from um, WMU, for example? Okay, when uh, American students go abroad, right? You're asking about when American students go abroad as opposed to your students coming to us. Yeah, and that's a very good question. So um, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I, uh, one of my grants was uh, from the National Science Foundation that uh, was uh, to fund the research, but in collaboration with Brazil. And that's what enabled me to take uh, quite a number of students with me to uh, Brazil to uh, UFSCar, to uh, Federal San Carlos. So um, uh, what I did, and that was part of my plan, part of my proposal, I actually uh, did for them a whole month of preparation because uh, obviously we sometimes don't realize, or American students don't realize, how much there is to learn about uh, other cultures. Among uh, my students, actually some of them uh, have never been on an airplane, and among the students that I took with me to Moscow, by the way, on another grant, on my grant with Russia, uh, they didn't even have a passport, and believe it or not, have never been to Canada, and we are like so close to Canada. So um, obviously, uh, many American students are not prepared, and you have to prepare them. So I took a whole month, and during that month, I did several things. First of all, I had the, I think it's CAPES or was it, a Brazilian agency that funded students to come to my lab, Brazilian students. So during that month, they came, of course, they benefited from that, they liked it, but also uh, they spent a lot of time with the American students, integrated them into the Brazilian culture. I also brought uh, speakers on miscellaneous aspects of Brazilian culture. So the bottom line is it was a whole month of preparation prior to the trip. I would have done probably more if these were all WMU students, but the truth is that my NSF grant did not limit me to WMU students, and approximately one third of the students that I took were from other universities. There was from University of New Orleans, um, North Carolina, so I had from other universities too. So they, they just came to me for that month prior to the time that I took them with me to Brazil. So yeah, so that's why, but as I said, this month was a, a very intense preparation for the research itself because, you know, um, they did the death preparation obviously too, as well as to miscellaneous uh, cultural aspects. And um, yeah, and, and it worked well. It really worked well. Great. Great. Um, another question for you related to your work um, with smart materials. Um, if the work developed with football helmets is already being applied by NFL teams or local teams, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that is a very good question. So, um, uh, as I say, uh, there are two reasons why it, it was not done. It hasn't been done yet. And the number one is because uh, absolutely I'm sure that if I try to test the same helmet over the entire temperature uh, range that uh, American football is being placed, played, um, then uh, it, it, it's not, it won't work. I know it won't work. So I'm looking for solutions. Uh, one of them is to have like one material that will uh, take from the lowest temperatures up to a certain point. Then another one from a little bit before some overlap and then to the highest range. 
So there will be once a year that there will be a need to change, and I'm not done with that temperature, uh, those temperature measurements. That's reason number one. The other one is um, that uh, to do any um, anything that will go on humans, you need to do uh, what is called human subject research, and you, you need to get approval, and it has to be tested beyond the lab, beyond the instrument. You need it to be tested on humans and make sure that, you know, I say, you know, it will absorb the shock when, you know, is, is it really, maybe it causes higher shock? It won't, but, you know, you have to prove the case. And human subject is a very important um, test for anything that goes on human beings. So no, not yet, but uh, we are still working on it. And actually, I, I we were in a pretty advanced stages in March when uh, we had to stop the experimental research. Uh, the students had to be out of the lab. Uh, so yeah, we are ready to continue, but you know, we are halfway. Mm. That's very promising. Very interesting also. Um, there's yeah. another- Extremely promising so far, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, there's not much of a question, it's more of um, an, an affirmation to you, Professor Susanna. She said that she liked your, your presentation very much and she would share her, uh, your presentation with her colleagues in the computer department, try to analyze how um, we can collaborate in the future, in the near future. Okay, just so you know. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Nina, for your presentation, for your presentation also here with us. Um, we are coming to an end of our series of webinars here. I would like to invite Professor Julio Villanova to give the former. Yeah. Alô. Thank you, Professor. Alô, boa Thank noite. You. Boa noite. Boa noite a todos. Boa noite a todos que nos assistem. Fui convidado para say a few words to close this uh, yes. very interesting series of webinars. Agradecer primeiro ao Professor Paulo Zagallo Melo. A, a nossa querida Amanda Farias, que fez a ponte, é a, a, a liaison da, da é, Western Michigan University, aos professores que apresentaram é, seus trabalhos nos últimos é, dois encontros. E a gente concluiu hoje com, acho que com chave de ouro, com uma, um painel muito interessante de diferentes áreas, né, com uma, uma amostra muito rica do que se faz de, em pesquisa na, na WMU. E eu tenho certeza que o evento vai, é, vai frutificar, eu espero que é o, é o início de uma série, então agradecer, é, é, falando em nome do, do NINTER, do Núcleo de Internacionalização do Instituto IP, é, é, um, é um primeiro evento que, que nós estamos promovendo e tivemos a sorte de, de, de ter essa parceria tão, tão importante para a nossa universidade. É, lembrar que estamos numa fase de é, renovar as energias para a internacionalização, pensando não apenas... No, na mobilidade em si, né, até porque o, o momento não permite. Então, nós temos e tivemos aqui é, interessantíssimas uh, opções de, de trabalho à distância, né, é, promovidas pela, pela WMU, e, e com a possibilidade de é, estreitarmos os, os laços né, da, das nossas duas universidades. É, quero parabenizar os, os três professores de, de, de hoje. Thank you very much for such a, a, an interesting panel of what is of what is done in research at WMU. Thank you, Dr. Arigu, Dr. Dr. Alessander, Dr. Virginia. Uh, and and that, uh, that's it. I think that there were some interesting questions. If there's anybody else with any other question, I think João, João might uh, uh, forward. Professor Zagallo, muito obrigado. Uh, temos certeza que o web, a série de webinars vai frutificar e a gente... Uh, vai ter novas oportunidades em breve. Eu é que agradeço a oportunidade que a Rural deu à WMU para essa colaboração. Uh, foi fantástico uh, o nosso primeiro contato com a, com a, a Rural para, para planejar um, um, um webinário. Foi, foi, a, a reunião foi tão... Uh, tão Frutuosa que a gente acabou com três webinários, não é? E, e esse é o, é o último webinário, não é o final, 
Esse é o final do começo só. Esse webinário de hoje é só o final do começo da grande parceria que vai ser, que já é essa parceria da Western com, com a Rural. E esse foi a primeira série de, desse, um, desse tipo de, de webinário que a gente desenvolveu com uma parceira, com uma parceira internacional. Portanto, foi um projeto pioneiro entre a Rural e a, e a Western Michigan. Um, eu estou muito agradecido a todos na Rural. João, muito obrigado por todo o trabalho que você fez durante esses três webinários. Uh, também meus agradecimentos ao reitor, professor Marcelo Leão. Uh, muito obrigado, Rita Maia, na assessoria da Cooperação Internacional e todos que trabalham na internacionalização na Rural. Muito obrigado a todos. Uh, e professor Júlio Villanova, muito obrigado por todo o apoio hoje também e pelas simpáticas palavras um, para os nossos palestrantes e, e para o futuro da nossa parceria. Muito obrigado. É, agradecer mais uma vez a professora Rita, que é a, a, a diretora do Núcleo de Internacionalização, o, o professor Ricardo Souza, que é o diretor do Instituto IP, né, por essa, pela realização desse evento. É, temos, então, uma, uma, novas pontes é, abertas para esse diálogo, essa parceria. Os nossos colegas lá da unidade do Cabo de Santo Agostinho, que trabalham com engenharia, tiveram uma, uma oportunidade muito interessante de, de ouvir a professora é, Arinur. A, a professora Virginia, é, o seu, nós temos um recentíssimo programa de pós-graduação em estudos da linguagem, então a sua fala, é, que me lembrou muito o, o meu período de graduação na universidade, quando trabalhei com transcrição de, de, de inquéritos, de estudos de análise da conversação, então é uma área também que nos interessa muito, assim como a área de ciência é, de forma geral. Muito obrigado a todos pela participação. Os, os webinários vão ficar gravados, né, estão salvos no, no canal do, do YouTube da, da nossa é, Rural. E quem não pôde estar presente hoje aqui vai ter a chance de é, assistir. Tá? E, e os, os canais e os contatos estão também disponíveis para o, o, as, as, próximas, as, as conversas né, com a WMU, através do professor Paulo Zagallo. Muito obrigado, muito boa noite a todos. Fiquem bem e se cuidem. Um abraço. Tchau, pessoal. Boa noite a todos também. Boa noite. Nossa.